Today is the day that Tesla owners across North America hoped would never come. Now, Tesla owners love their electric vehicles. I know I own two Teslas, two Tesla Model 3s, and I love both of them. Great vehicles. But they may love something even more than their cars, and that's the exclusive access to Tesla's supercharger network. Tesla's supercharger network is a fantastic, comprehensive network of high-speed DC fast chargers that enable long-distance driving with Tesla vehicles. It's such an advantage that it brings people out of buying other electric vehicles into Teslas just because it's so much of a better charging experience when you're charging with Tesla vehicles than it is with other electric vehicles. So many of my followers have said something like, hey, Tom, you know, I, I was thinking about getting, say, a Hyundai Ionic 5, but I ended up getting a Tesla Model Y because of the charging network. I, I'm worried that I won't be able to find chargers when, when they're out there, they're broken and uh, they're unreliable, but Tesla's supercharger network works practically all the time. They have fantastic locations. It's just such a better public charging experience. It actually changes people's mind, minds on which electric vehicle they're gonna buy. And, and also, you know, somebody with a beautiful Porsche Taycan pulls up next to your Tesla or a Lucid Air, you can always just look down your nose at them and say, yeah, but you don't have the supercharger network. And they would be right. However, that's changing today. Tesla has been, well, Elon Musk, Tesla CEO, has been saying for years he was going to open up the supercharger network so electric vehicle owners from other makes can access superchargers. Today's the day. Today, that has begun. Now, the entire supercharger network isn't open. They're starting to do a rollout, and I'm driving about 100 miles north up to Brewster, New York, to use one of the superchargers that have been enabled now to charge CCS vehicles. I have a 2022 Ford F-150 Lightning, which I'm driving in right now. We're gonna to try to charge my F-150 Lightning at a Tesla supercharger in Brewster, New York. Hopefully everything works and I'll be able to plug in and we'll explain how you charge uh, non-Teslas at Tesla superchargers and all that stuff. Maybe if I'm lucky, I'll even get a chance to talk to a Tesla owner that's charging there at the site uh, and see uh, how happy they are that this big Ford F-150 Lightning pulled up next to them and plugged in. Hopefully I can plug in. That's another issue that we're gonna talk about when we get there. Um, the Tesla supercharger cables aren't that long. I don't know if it's gonna reach. I don't wanna have to park sideways and block two stalls, but. We're going to talk about all that when I get there. Listen, if this is your first time here at State of Charge, please click that subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you don't miss any electric vehicle news and reviews, and stay tuned. This video is powered by QMerit, North America's leading provider of installation services for electric vehicle charging, home energy storage, and other electrification technologies. See how Qmera is making the energy transition easy for home and business owners by following the link in the description of this video. All right, so we're getting close. We're only about 10 miles away now. And before we get there, I wanted to talk a little bit about why this is even necessary. Why couldn't every electric vehicle charge at every electric vehicle charging station? Well, it's a little complicated. It's basically, Tesla was a very early adopter of electric vehicles, one of the first companies to, to really develop, probably the first company to go out and develop a full line of fully electric vehicles. And when they started doing this, there were no standards for plugs. Back in the, you know, 2008, 2009, when Tesla was really getting going, there was no industry standard for plugs. I drove a, a 2009 electric Mini Cooper and it had its own proprietary connector. It was from an ODU connector. There, was no, there were no standards. So Tesla developed their own uh, proprietary connector that, that uh, only they could use. No one was allowed to use the Tesla connector. Now, a few months ago, Tesla finally opened it up and said, okay, now anybody can use this uh, and we're gonna call it the North American Charging Standard or NACS, but um, there's no takers on that. And to be honest with you, what's happening now with Tesla opening up the supercharger network to other vehicles, that's gonna make it even less likely for another manufacturer to say, okay, yeah, we're gonna switch and use your connector because if their vehicles can get access to Tesla superchargers now anyway, 
they're, that makes it a lot less likely that anybody is going to switch to, to Tesla's connector. But in any event, early on, it was proprietary. No one was allowed to use it. So the other electric vehicles uh, manufacturers used what the SAE developed. And um, the, the J1772 plug was for AC charging. And uh, the CCS, or combined charging system, was for DC fast charging, which is what we're going to be doing on a Tesla supercharger. So Tesla vehicles use their proprietary connector pretty much every other electric vehicle used a connector called ccs now early on nissan also was very early they they were using a standard called chatamo i don't want to really get into that too much right now because it's um it's being phased out in north america uh nissan still uses it for the leaf mitsubishi still uses it for the plug-in uh, hybrid Outlander, but they're the only vehicles that use it and they won't be for much longer. So it's basically going to be CCS and Tesla. So what happened was Tesla wanted to give access to their customers for CCS network. So they developed an adapter. I have one here. This is the uh, CCS adapter for Tesla vehicles. So you'd plug in a CCS connector here and then plug this into your Tesla vehicle. So Tesla vehicles have had access to CCS DC fast chargers, but people that drove CCS vehicles like my uh, Lightning here, my Rivian, uh, they could never access Tesla superchargers. It's proprietary. Even if you developed a, uh, an adapter, if somebody was smart enough to figure out and develop an adapter, there was an authentication process involved where the station had to identify the vehicle as a Tesla vehicle, so it would never work. Tesla had to authorize this uh, in order for it to work. And as I said, Tesla's been saying they're gonna do it for years now, and people were starting to wonder, are they ever gonna do it? But now it seems like the new um, infrastructure plan that where there's this giant pool of, of, of incredible amount of money, uh, Tesla wants to tap into that. And one of the qualifications is that their charging stations have to be able to serve all electric vehicles, not just their electric vehicles. So th without admitting it, Tesla has not said, oh yeah, that's why we're opening it up now. Uh, it seems uh, coincidence that now all of a sudden, they've been talking about it for years, but now when this public funds is available and they have to be able to service other electric vehicles, now Tesla said, oh yeah, we're gonna let everybody use our network. So whatever the reason, it's starting to be open now. And uh, the way Tesla is incorporating this is, there's, they call it the magic dock. And uh, the, it ha their connector now has a built-in CCS connector. So sort of built into the, the Tesla supercharger. We'll take a look at it when we get there. So the Tesla connector snaps into the CCS adapter. And if you own a Tesla, you come up, you just take your Tesla connector and plug it into your vehicle. But if you have a CCS vehicle like I have here, you have to first um, uh, get an account with Tesla, give them your credit card, and you'll have an app. And when you pull up, you swipe to activate that specific charging station, and it unlocks the CCS adapter that's tethered to the Tesla connector. It's a pretty neat uh, solution. Everybody was wondering, well, how are we going to do this? Are, is Tesla going to sell an adapter? Are they going to build uh, superchargers that have CCS plugs? Nobody knew exactly what was going to happen. And Tesla is, is uh, famous for keeping things top secret, not talking to the media. And they kept this secret for a long time. Nobody really knew what was going to happen until very recently that they were going to make this um, built-in solution that's built into the superchargers. And the beauty of it is they don't have to install new superchargers. Uh, all they have to do is retrofit the existing superchargers with what they call the magic dock. Okay, so we're only a few miles away now. Let's uh, check in when we arrive and uh, hopefully the station isn't too backed up and hopefully I'll be able to reach with the connector because that's, a, that's an issue. The cables on the CCS charging stations are much longer than Tesla supercharger uh, cables are. And Tesla never had to make long cables because all of their charge ports are in the rear uh, left side of the vehicle and the Tesla vehicle is back into the spot and the connector is just right there. Other electric vehicles have charge ports all over the vehicle, the back, the side, the front, the lightning, it's in the front quarter panel and it's not close to the front of the vehicle. My Rivian R1T, the charge port's in the same side, but it's way up in the front corner of the vehicle. The Lightning, it's like four feet behind the bumper. So I don't know if the cable's gonna reach. Um, that's gonna be interesting, but we're gonna find out really soon when I pull into the supercharger in uh, GPS is saying four minutes. We'll check in then. 
Okay, so I just pulled up and we already have a Lucid Air charging. We have Marquise Brownlee next to me in a Rivian R1T charging. <laughs> and I pulled into the only spot that it might reach and I don't think it's going to. I haven't plugged in yet. There are two Teslas here charging also. But I tried to pull into the first spot. That definitely wouldn't reach. So now I'm going back over to this spot. We're going to try to unlock it. And we're going to see if the connector reaches. If not, I don't know what I'm going to do. We're going to have to wait till somebody leaves. And I don't have to park sideways and kind of block two spots. So let's see if we can plug in. Okay, so after repositioning my truck, I had to move it over and pull it up as far as I could. I think it's going to just make it. So now let me... Get the app out here, click on Brewster, now charge here, then you find the, the post number. They're located on the bottom here, I'm at 1C, so I'm going to click 1C, and then it says unlock adapter. So click unlock adapter, I heard it unlock, so let's see this, okay, pulled out, super. Now let's see if it's going to reach. Okay. We pulled up as far as I possibly could. This can't be good for this, for this cable. I don't like it. I think I just... No. I, I, I could possibly push it in, but it's not good. No. Do I have any room up front, Marquise? I'm here with Marquise Brownlee. He's charging his Rivian R1T. You've got a, a little push of maybe three, four, five inches. Let, all right, let's, let, let's try that. Oh. Could you hold this for me? I don't want to lock it again. Yep. Let's pull up a little bit more. Oops. I need my phone as a key. Oh. <laughs> Okay, let me get my front camera going. Let me see if I could pull up. Okay, it's gonna rock back though, I think. All right, I know. How bad is it? Damn, the snow here is killing me. I don't think we're gonna make it. I'll try one more time and if not, let's see. Actually, that did it. That was enough to lock it. Now, this is not ideal. You don't want to strain your cable like this. This is definitely not what you want. Um, we're doing it now, and we are charging, so it's working. Um, but I do not advise people doing this. Find another solution. I'm probably going to move the truck. I just wanted to see if we could get it to reach. And it actually does reach. An F-150 Lightning charge point will reach. Um, at least in this specific location, there's a, about two inches to the bollard in front of me, um, and uh, it's working. I hear my uh, fans kicking on in the truck, so I'm charging at a Tesla supercharger with my Ford F-150 Lightning next to a Rivian R1T that's charging and a Lucid Air. So. Uh, Pretty big day in the world of electric vehicles. Tesla's finally opened up their supercharger network, limited, you know, just a few locations right now. We don't know how many, we don't know where they're gonna be installed, but it's a good start. If you own a CCS vehicle, today is a good day. If you're a Tesla owner, today is not a good day. You might wanna go out and have a few drinks because soon that exclusivity the being able to just drive wherever you want and plug in, it's going to get more complicated because superchargers are going to start to get clogged up with non-Tesla vehicles. Now, I was really hoping that I could get a Tesla owner to come on camera and talk to me about how he felt about all these other electric vehicles charging at a Tesla supercharger station. Unfortunately, this station didn't have a lot of action. There were more non-Tesla cars pulling in and charging than actual Tesla cars, and I couldn't get any Tesla owners to comment on camera about it. But 
off camera, I had a 50-50 response. One person said he thinks it's great, it's great for the industry. Another person was concerned that, well, you know, I, I, I hope this doesn't mean that I'm gonna have to wait in line now when I need to charge. So 50-50, but a very small sample. But what I did get to do was speak to the Lucid owner and get his opinion on what it's like to now be able to access Tesla superchargers. All right, so I'm here in Brewster, New York, and I'm here with Larry, the Lucid Air owner. Larry wanted to check out Tesla Supercharger, the Magic Dock, all that stuff, so he came up here today. I noticed you're parked really crooked. Are you just like a terrible parker? <laughs> well, because of Tesla, I am. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the cable, uh, it's too short, uh, so I wasn't able, I tried to pull up to the ones that you have, and for me to get close enough, I actually would have had to crash my bumper into the charging station just yeah. to make the cable reach, but luckily, the, you know, this station has the, uh, the side-facing one, yeah. um, and so I, you know, I was able to pull up to this one. If, if the snow banks weren't there, I probably could have gotten a little closer. A little closer, but, yeah, but yeah. still, and you know, I had the same issue, but your, the front of your Lucid Air is longer than the front of my Lightning. It looks, yeah. the charge port is just maybe an inch or so further back, and I barely reached. As a matter of fact, the cable is strained more than I'm comfortable with. Oh, yeah, and I, I literally see, yeah. touched the bollard with my front bumper in order to make it work. I was yeah. here with Marquise before, and we were trying to figure out how, and he was guiding me, and of course, I tapped the the, the, the bollard, but um, <laughs> so I'm not happy with that. When you leave, I'm gonna pull over here because sure. I, I don't like to see cable strain that much, but yeah, uh, enough about point. me. Yeah. So, um, uh, thoughts on being able to use Tesla superchargers instead of, you know, everything else that's out there? Um, it, I mean, it's a good first step. Uh, I mean, it's it's nice because the supercharger network is pretty reliable. Um, it seems to work. Like, I've had a Tesla as a rental car. Mm -hmm. You just plug it in, it works. And that was the same thing with this. I just picked it on the app, plugged it in, it worked. Mm -hmm. The downside is it's kind of slow on the loose. So it's, I'm getting 45 kilowatts, um, mm -hmm. I think, because that's of the, it. the battery. I'm pulling 125 kilowatts now. So, yeah, yeah just... Um, battery architecture, I yeah. guess. Or uh, how I, I, I don't know. Um, is the battery really cold? I mean, there could be no, other I, features. No, I, I preconditioned. You did preconditioned. Okay. And I yeah. came here, I know when I got here, I was at 38% state yeah. of charge. Okay. So I did precondition. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I know the Wonder Box converts to 800, but, but it should. I would think it would pull more than 40 kilowatts. But in any yeah. event, that, that's what you're getting. Yeah. Um, and uh, it still might be better than the alternative. <laughs> how, how do you find uh, CCS networks out there like EVgo and Electrify America and ChargePoint? Are you happy with the state of DC fast charging? No. Um, you know, I. to be fair, I've taken several road trips and most of the time I've been able to DC fast charge. I have that same experience. Yeah. And, but. But the <laughs> problem is particularly the, um, the ABB older Electrify America units, mm -hmm. I have a lot of problems with that in my car. Um, yeah. The site near me in Providence, Rhode Island, I cannot charge my car. Wow. Um, I, every single station that I park at, every single time, yeah. it'll accept the plug and charge payment, but then it errors out and it says failure to charge. I've talked with Lucid about it. Lucid's talked to EA. They just, they can't Have you tried disabling the plug and charge just to see if you can charge without it? Because I've heard so, that works for some people. Even I, though it I says it, that. It's a, yeah. try that next time because yeah. even though it said accepted, yeah. it still could be some type of handshake issue. So just try that out next time. Yeah. But um, so do you plan on using Tesla superchargers frequently now or uh, not? As a backup. As a backup. Yeah. Do you I mean, I, I, I'm, the way that I prefer to do it, honestly, if I can find somewhere at my destination where I'm going to be staying overnight that's a level two charger yep just plug it overnight it's like it's, it's a way it's to much go easier, if you can free. if you can do you charge at home yes i yes, charge at good. home uh, yeah, that's, as you that's should that's if you thing. can yeah always charge your electric vehicles at home if you have the ability to. These are to enable long distance traveling and for people that can't charge at home. I think too many people rely on public charging infrastructure that don't have to and then that clogs it up for everybody else. But yeah. we did another video on that. <laughs> well, the other issue too, uh, particularly with this, with this short cable, because yeah. uh, I mean, this isn't the only car that's got a charging port kind of far back. Yeah. The only other way I would be able to fit into these is if I pulled in horizontally and then I'm gonna be blocking like three charging uh, no. sites just to do it, which I, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I have a feeling I'm no. going to be doing that at some point in the future, yeah. but um, we'll we'll see. Hopefully, yeah. it, 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 Tesla owners will be uh, understanding. <laughs> if I really need a charge, and that's the only way I can plug in, you know. Um, Hopefully it doesn't end up in uh, fisticuffs. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> anyway, listen, thank you so yeah, much thanks, for Tom. the time. I appreciate it. Yeah, Good luck, beautiful it. car. Oh, I love Lucid's. I love the fact that Tesla's oh, yeah, finally opening up the supercharger network. Although, 
as we've seen, there's gonna be issues that need to get resolved. Hopefully Tesla's already working on that. If I know Tesla, they are because it's a super smart company, forward thinking. I bet you they come up with some type of solution yeah. so that this um, does get dealt with. With the, um, the V4 superchargers, mm -hmm. the ones that are supposedly like a thousand volt architecture, mm -hmm. have you heard anything about? Those cables would have can. to be longer. Yeah. But, but you know, I don't know. It's, listen, Tesla is impossible to get any information from. <laughs> it's good on one hand, good for them. It's secretive. You know, people don't get there, uh, you know, jump on what they're doing. But it's really hard to figure out what they're doing, especially for journalists. It's frustrating because they don't tell us anything. But uh, that's another story. Larry, thank you very much. Tom, thanks. Good luck with the Lucy. All right, yeah, you can have this uh, site now. Let's see if that works. Yeah, definitely. I want to plug in over here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I moved my Lightning over to where the Lucid Air was charging. Now let's see how the cable reaches over here. So I'm going to open up my Tesla app. I have my charging summary, but now it needs to reload. Now it reloaded. Okay, click on this. Charge here. This is stall 1A, so I have to click post 1A, and then I'm going to unlock adapter. You hear that click? This just clicked. There we go. We're all finished up. I just ended the charging session through the Tesla app. It unlocked the connector. You gotta press the tab on top, unlock it, and this just goes snap, easy peasy. So overall, I had a great experience charging my F-150 Lightning at the Tesla Supercharger today. Now, I had always been concerned about compatibility. Talking to the network operators that are out there now, the big guys, and I'm not going to name any names other than Tesla, they had always said, well, Tesla has it easy. They're vertically integrated. They control the software in the car, the software in the chargers. They control the hardware. So, of course, everything's going to work seamlessly. But we have to create hardware that communicates with all these different types of electric vehicles, and then the manufacturers change their software, and we've got to go in and, and uh, change our software so it's compatible, and that's why we have compatibility issues. That's why sometimes the charging stations just uh, stop charging midway through a session or won't initiate a session, and it was really hard to tell if they were telling the truth or not. But now seeing how seamless this worked, how just I went plugged in, did the app, pulled the dock out, plugged in my car. It started charging faster than it does when I'm initiating an Electrify America charging session. So, you know, I know it's only one vehicle. Um, it's possible that maybe BMW owners are going to find that there's some type of compatibility issue. But, you know, I saw Lucid Air charging, although he was only pulling 40 kilowatts. And that's odd. He should be pulling a lot more. I'm not sure why that was, but um, hey, we all know that Elon really has an in for Peter Rawlinson, the CEO of Lucid. How epic level trolling would it be if Tesla limits Lucid charging to 40 kilowatts? Now, I'm sure that's not the case, but then that would be epic level trolling if Tesla did that. Uh, but I mean, that's the things that we have to look out for. Are, are some EVs not gonna work? Are some gonna get half charging rate? I was pulling 125 kilowatts as soon as I plugged in and it crept up to 128 kilowatt before it started gradually ramping down as I approached 80% charge. So I'm super happy with my charging experience. It was as good as it could be. Um, but uh, you know, we're gonna see if there's issues with other uh, vehicles. If there's not, then you know that reinforces the fact that these other networks just don't have their game together because there's all kind of charging issues going on throughout the industry, not just one network, a lot of the networks. So it's going to be really interesting to see how this rolls out. And if everybody has the same easy charging experience as I had, then we know, you know, it's <laughs> it's not that hard. If Tesla can provide this kind of great service for all the makes, so should the other networks be able to. So in any event, my biggest problem, as you could see, was the uh, the length of the cable. And um, that's a huge problem, by the way. If, if nothing happens to correct this, there's going to be huge problems. Because at first, when I pulled in next to Marquise Brownlee and his Rivian, um, if you notice, I was able to stretch the cable and, and plug in. But I was charging in the spot that Marquise's 
or the charger was supposed to be for that stall. He was using the char the uh, the charger for the next stall. So it just so happened we had two vehicles there, so we were only taking up three stalls. But um, in normal circumstances, if there's not another non-Tesla charging next to you, you're going to be blocking two stalls. That's a big problem, and that's if the cable reaches. So, you know, Tesla needs to work on this. Now, there's some talk about the V4 superchargers. That's the next-gen superchargers are going to have longer cables, and we've seen some drawings of those, and they appear to have much longer cables. But Tesla's not going to go out and just swap out all their the whole network with new V4 charging stations. I mean, they didn't do that when the V3s came out. They still kept their old V2 chargers out there. They didn't upgrade all of them. So it's not like that's going to be everywhere. So this is going to be a problem. It's going to be a problem for a long time. Perhaps eventually Tesla will correct it. And we still don't know if Tesla's going to install these on a majority of the network, 10% of the network, you know, that, all those questions we have no uh, answers to at this point, but it's a great start that they finally opened it up or began to open it up. So non-Tesla electric vehicles are gonna have access to Tesla superchargers. Now let's talk about cost. I paid $25.97 and I took in 53 kilowatt hours. I paid 49 cents per kilowatt hour. Not a terrible price. Considering on Electrify America, the non-member rate is, I think, close to that, within a few cents of that. Now, I pay 36 cents per kilowatt hour, but I also pay the $4 a month membership fee on Electrify America for the Pass Plus account. So I would pay less on Electrify America. However, if I want to join Tesla's membership, it's $12.99 a month. So basically, you know, you'd need to take in about 130 kilowatt hour a month for it to be worth that because what you do is you get about a 10 cent savings per kilowatt hour. At this site, I would have paid 39 cents per kilowatt hour. As I said, I paid 49 cents per kilowatt hour, but I did a search of all of the superchargers in New York that are opened, and there's one site that charges 51 cents per kilowatt hour instead of the 49. I guess it's a, a, a local electric rate is a little bit higher, but then the membership fee was still 39 cents per kilowatt hour. So I assumed at first it was a 10 cent savings across the board, but I don't think that's the case. I think the membership rate, if you pay $12.99 a month, you pay 39 cents per kilowatt hour, which if you're gonna use Tesla's network frequently, it's worth doing. But realize the break even point is probably around 130 kilowatt hours. So if you say, if you had a Model 3, you're gonna need to fully charge it at least twice a month for you to break even. So I think for most people, they'll probably pay the non-network rate and uh, just use a supercharger whenever they need to. And that probably makes the most financial sense. All right, well, the Tesla supercharger network is finally beginning to be opened up to non-Tesla vehicles. I wanna hear your opinions on this and specify if you're a Tesla owner or a non-Tesla owner or you don't even own EVs and you just wanna weigh in on it, that's fine too, because this is bound to be controversial. I'd love to hear people's opinions on this and how Tesla is implementing it. You know, I, I knew it was going to happen eventually, and I, I think for Tesla as a company, it's the right move. For Tesla owners, they're gonna, complain about it, many of them, I think, for, for quite some time because it's definitely going to make a difference uh, in, in supercharger accessibility. Now, Tesla has continued to expand the network, and hopefully now that they're opening up the network to CCS vehicles, they'll step up installing new sites even more. So if this is your first time here at State of Charge, don't forget to smash that subscribe button so you don't miss any upcoming electric vehicle news and reviews. And as always, thanks for watching.